1978's Halloween isn't just one of my favorite scary movies, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Directed and co-written by horror legend John Carpenter and co-written and produced by Deborah Hill, it is a masterclass in suspense that helps set the standard for a type of horror movie that's still being made. And as we approach October the 31st, 45 years after the film was originally released, there's no time like the present to break down all the reasons why I love Halloween. Number one, the music. Halloween, both the movie and the holiday itself, and John Carpenter's score for the film have become linked forever. And I think that this score is actually some of the best music ever written for any movie. It's incredibly simple and yet indescribably menacing, especially when you listen to the main Halloween theme. The last 20 minutes of the movie are also almost entirely carried by the score and wouldn't work nearly as well without Carpenter setting the mood and raising the tension. Good movie music complements a movie, great movie music becomes a character, and the music in Halloween is absolutely a character. The recording of the score has passed into legend. Different sources say it took between two weeks and three days, but it remains one of horror and film's most memorable and effective uses of music and smartly gets used right at the beginning to set the mood. Which brings me to number two, the opening credits. This is what people mean when they use the phrase setting the mood. We hear Carpenter score over a very simple image as we slowly zoom into a jack-o'-lantern. It's a simple, almost childlike image, but the juxtaposition of it against the score tells us that we're about to be confronted with something terrible on a night that's usually devoted to fun. As the light on the pumpkin goes out and we're just left with the glow within, our journey into darkness begins as we roll straight into number three, the opening sequence. Things get off to a creepy start with a flashback sequence to the murder of Judith Myers by a young Michael Myers. I love the idea of making this a first person, seemingly unbroken shot. We as an audience are put off kilter immediately because we're put into the shoes and behind the eyes of a killer. We want to look away, but we can't. It makes you feel complicit in a strange sense. And I also like how Michael's arms are distorted, particularly when he reaches for the mask on the floor. Now, whether that's intentional or an unintentional effect because of distortion due to the type of lens being used and the proximity of the arm to the camera, it adds an otherworldly quality. And finally, we get a murder similar to Janet Lee's in Psycho, although this time we are Norman Bates as the knife plunges down into poor Judith. It's a great way to start the movie off unexpectedly, ending with the dolly shot out from the innocent looking face of a small child, not the bloody psychopath that we may have been expecting. Also, and this has been mentioned before in this real-time sequence, Judas' boyfriend leaves about 70 seconds after turning out the light to do the dirty deed. For the record, my vote is that this is a sly nod to the over-exuberance of the teenage male from John Carpenter and Deborah Hill, and not a mistake or some sort of time compression, because after all, Minutemen didn't go away at the end of the American Revolution. Number four, the cinematography. Even outside of the opening sequence, Halloween is an exceptionally photographed film by cinematographer Dean Cundey, especially given its extremely low budget and lack of resources. It's helped by the then recent advancements in handheld filmmaking. The Steadicam had been invented just three years before, and much of Halloween was shot on a Panaglide, which is basically the same concept that had been invented by Panavision. This allowed Halloween to shoot in lots of practical locations using natural or low light with the ability of shooting from the point of view of certain characters or even documentary style and also shooting things very quickly. It feels real. In addition to the more naturalistic scenes, there's also great use of light and shadow throughout the film, as well as lots of complex shots that require choreography and precise camera movements. This was near the beginning of Dean Cundey's career. In addition to lots of other John Carpenter films, he also shot movies like Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Apollo 13, and what I think is his crowning achievement, Jack and Jill. That's not a joke. Halloween, Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, and Jack and Jill all share the same cinematographer. Number five, Laurie Strode and Jamie Lee Curtis. 
Halloween is one of a few franchises where the first movie's final girl is as famous as the killer, and Jamie Lee Curtis paved the way for the Nev Campbells of the next generation, or maybe just for Nev Campbell. The things that we like about Laurie Strode in this movie are also the things that have given Jamie Lee Curtis so much longevity and popularity throughout her career. She seems genuinely nice, kind, caring, and the sort of person that you don't want to see bad things happen to. Carpenter and Hill do a great job of writing Laurie as a sympathetic protagonist and not just a teenager who's ordered to scream on camera. We get to hear about the guy that Laurie likes. We see that she's good with kids and loyal to friends that, let's be honest, kind of use her as a doormat. I'm standing right there. Poor Laurie. Scared another one away. And Laurie's characterization makes sense when you see what audiences had responded to already in the 1970s horror world. 1973's The Exorcist featured the desecration of an innocent child. 1974's Black Christmas was about a mass killer stalking a group of young girls. 1975's Jaws featured an everyman put into an impossible situation against an unstoppable opponent. 1976's Carrie featured a high school girl capable of great power under pressure. And so in Laurie Strode, we have an innocent high school girl put in an impossible situation against an unstoppable opponent when she and her friends are stalked by a mass killer who finds that she is capable of great power under pressure. Halloween may not have invented the slasher genre, but it successfully synthesized everything that had worked so far into a formula that was then carried forward and replicated for decades to come. And the key to that formula is Laurie Strode and the genre-defining confidence and terror that Jamie Lee Curtis put into her still great and sympathetic performance. The boogeyman can only come out on Halloween night, right? Right. While I'm here tonight, I'm not about to let anything happen to you. Promise? Promise. Number six, the mystery of Michael Myers. As horror franchises go on, they're forced to demystify their bad guys, largely because there's really nothing else to do. How long can you plausibly have someone carve up teenagers before you start having to explain why they're doing it? Even the shark in Jaws eventually needed a motivation. Come on, you can't believe that voodoo. Sharks don't commit murder, they don't pick out a person. It picked and out Sean. It killed your father. But the great and terrible thing about Michael Myers in this movie is that he's a complete mystery. He's even referred to in the credits as The Shape, stripped of the only thing, his name, that we really know about him. Dr. Loomis tells us everything that we need to know in this first movie. I spent eight years trying to reach him, and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. It's that sort of violence, random, unpredictable, and unfair, that most people fear every day. And it's bottled and distilled in this story of a babysitter forced to fend off a senseless murderer. Death has come to your little town, Sheriff. You can either ignore it or you can help me to stop it. Number seven, Donald Pleasance. Halloween was shot in the spring of 1978, which means John Carpenter was likely very aware of the value of having an established star in his cast of unknown actors. After all, Sir Alec Guinness had just legitimized George Lucas's Star Wars the summer before. Luckily, the role of Dr. Loomis isn't just fodder to bring in a familiar face for a few minutes, what many people now call a geezer teaser. Donald Pleasance is perhaps best remembered for this role, which is impressive considering his body of work. Loomis on the page is a simple character, a single-minded man with an obsession to keep Michael Myers away from the world. He's similar to Quint in Jaws and his drive to prevent others from seeing the evil that he's seen and has been scarred by. You know the thing about a shark, he's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eye. The blackest eyes the devil's eyes. You don't need any more information or flashbacks to young Michael Myers because Donald Pleasance and his acting fills that gap. Without Pleasance and Jamie Lee Curtis, it's possible that Halloween would have faded into obscurity as a 70s cult classic. Instead, they anchor the horror with a humanity that makes us even more scared of the inhuman killer on screen. He's gone. He's gone from here. The evil is gone. Number eight, the crotchety old graveyard man. Okay, enough of this serious actor talk. Halloween also has its share of guilty pleasures, from Linda's constant use of the word totally. She totally never shows. That's not true. Well, she's totally not here. And the dance is at eight. I'll be totally wiped out. I don't think you have enough to do tomorrow. Totally. To the obviously non-copyrighted names of Tommy Doyle's comic book collection. Laser Man. 
Neutron Man, I can understand why. Tarantula Man. To my personal favorite moment of cheese in the movie, the crotchety old man who runs the graveyard. I remember over in Russellville, old Charlie Bold, about 15 years ago. This is a part that is both written and acted in the most cliche manner possible, the old man who's seen it all. It's the horror movie equivalent of the Gordon Street guy from Wayne's World 2. Yeah, Myers, Judith Myers, I remember her. Gordon Street. Oh, yes, Gordon Street. And yet, for me, it works. It's a scene in the movie that reminds me that Halloween isn't just a trailblazer in the slasher genre, but it's also a movie capable of falling victim to its cliches and pitfalls. And hey, that's okay, too. Why do they do it, goddamn kids? Number nine, building tension. I watched Halloween with a theater audience of mainly people younger than me several years ago and found to my disappointment that it didn't seem to work as well on them. I think it's because this movie defies what many modern horror fans are used to and withholds much of the real horror until the third act. The more modern audience I watched it with seemed restless, but what they may have seen as a liability, I actually see as one of Halloween's biggest assets. We don't even get a really good look at Michael Myers until about 20 minutes before the end of the movie. Until then, he's either visible for a couple of seconds, seen at a distance, obscured by something, or being shot from behind. Before he's threatening as a killer, he's threatening as a presence. If you were going to have him start stabbing kids 30 minutes into the movie, you would have deflated the tension too early. You have to let it ratchet up until it releases, which is why after the flashback, Myers' kills happen off screen until Annie buys the farm in her car. And even when Michael Myers is stalking his victims, sometimes it's hard to even notice he's there. Like when he's behind Annie while she begs Lindsay to answer the phone in the laundry room. My personal favorite shot is Michael behind Annie while she's on the phone in the kitchen. He appears in the open door behind her with a light musical sting, then is gone when she crosses frame again. It's simple, but so effective. And the reason it's effective is because Michael's presence is designed to tap into... Number 10, Primal Terror. Primal Terror is one reason why Jaws was so effective with audiences. It's the idea of something in the water with you that you can't see or hear, but that can drag you beneath and kill you without warning. It's evolutionary, and Halloween taps into many of those same fears. The fear that there's someone behind us watching us. The fear of being looked at through a window. The fear of being stalked by a predator. Apart from the mortal terror that our characters feel when Michael directly threatens them, the first hour of the movie operates on the audience being creeped out secondhand by knowing that Michael is lurking close by without our character's knowledge. Hitchcock understood this too. If the audience knows something bad is about to happen, they're even more scared when it actually does happen. It's why the shower scene in Psycho is even scarier because you see the door open behind Marion Crane and the killer slowly enter and reach up to open the curtain before the murder happens. It's the anticipation. Janet Lee gave us a masterclass on this in 1960 and her daughter followed suit nearly two decades later. Number 11, Dr. Loomis being a dick. I'm not afraid. Bull. I'm not. Then go in. I love the grim and ominous Dr. Loomis, but I've also always loved this moment as well when he pranks the kids that are walking up to the Myers house. Hey. Hey, Lonnie. Get your ass away from there. It's not just that he pulls a pretty good prank. It's the sheepish grin that he allows himself afterwards. This serious man is only human, and he kind of likes torturing little jerks. I also respect that Carpenter didn't make Sheriff Brackett startling Loomis afterwards into a big jump scare moment because it would have deflated an otherwise humorous scene. And I like that the audience gets a chance to laugh shortly before the terror really begins to kick in. Number 12, Bob's Death. So we're taking a hard turn toward the end of the movie. Annie's already dead in her car, and Linda's boyfriend, Bob, has now made his way downstairs for a post-coital beer. This is a great way to build anticipation without Michael even being seen, and it goes back to the idea of the audience knowing something that the characters don't. Carpenter has established twice that Michael Myers is already in the house, so we know that Bob is going to get it, it's just a question of when and how he's going to get it. Is Michael near the fridge about to be revealed by the light? Nope. Is he lurking outside this open door? Uh-uh. Is he in this cupboard? No, not there either. 
And then just when we start to relax a little bit, he pops out of the second cupboard and sticks Bob to the wall with the knife. And yes, sticking him to this wall isn't physically possible for many reasons, but who cares? It's a cool kill and one where I don't mind the prolonged anticipation, which seems to be the only trick that most modern horror movies seem to know how to do nowadays. The first time I saw Halloween, I knew that this was going to happen because, like many in my generation, I first saw this kill in Scream. Here it comes. A nice reminder of how different generations experience movies differently. Also, bonus to Michael Myers for dressing up as a ghost to fool Linda afterwards. I'm not really sure why he did it, because he's usually not the playful type. It's not just the sheet, it's also putting Bob's glasses on outside the sheet to add that little extra touch. Inside, I think he always wanted to test just how stupid the kids he was killing are, and the answer is very. Most of them were very, very stupid. Totally. Number 13, The Shot. If you're a big Halloween fan, when I mention The Shot, you probably know exactly which one I'm talking about. Are you picturing it? After Lori goes across the street to investigate what's going on and triggers Michael's funhouse traps, she cowers next to an open door and slowly, almost imperceptibly, we see the white of Michael Myers' mask appear in the dark behind her. It's the stuff that literal nightmares are made of, and it's also one of the best things about the high-definition revolution. A whole generation lost much of the impact of this shot when it was transferred to standard-definition VHS tapes, and a lot of that that subtle lighting was lost in grain and noise. The recovery began when DVDs came into fashion, and now you get a great quality version of this shot on all high-definition formats and on streaming. The subtlety and timing of this shot is impeccable. The way they bring up the light just enough, it's my favorite shot in the movie, and taps into that most primal of fears, the monster just over your shoulder that's about to get you. Number 14, The Closet Light. As menacing as Michael Myers is in the background and in the shadows, I've always found him particularly disturbing when he breaks into the closet to get Lori and the light turns on. I think it's because of just how ordinary the setting is. It's a normal closet, probably looks like the one that you have at your house, and yet here's this monster breaking through, cornering and trying to kill an innocent teenager. And this particular beat before Lori stabs Michael and, well, she thinks kills him, has always been the scariest for me because of just how average this setting looks. It's not the darkness and shadows of a Hollywood horror film. It is the bright white everyday light bulb look of, well, every room in my house. And finally, we come to the last thing that I love about Halloween, and it's fitting because every movie needs a great ending. Number 15, The End. After Lori has killed Michael for the second time, we get our final ending, which starts with him sitting up behind her. One of the all-time great scary movie moments. If you have a few minutes, there's an audience member named Kyle J. Wood who recorded his movie theater crowd watching Halloween back in 1979, about a year after the movie came out, and uploaded the audio to YouTube back in 2011. And it's amazing to hear the audience reaction back then. Just when it looks like Laurie Strode is toast, Dr. Loomis comes to the rescue and shoots Michael off a balcony to what seems like his third death of the movie. What follows is one of the greatest closing exchanges in movie history. What's the boogeyman? As a matter of fact, it was. Until it's revealed that Michael Myers is gone. He isn't dead and he's nowhere to be seen. The evil is still out there as we revisit scenes from the movie with Michael's masked breathing getting louder and louder. <laughs> It's a perfect horror movie ending and in a just world would have marked the end of this franchise altogether. Alas. Why the hell are you dressed like me anyway? I ain't paying you to be Michael Myers. 
I'm playing Michael Myers. So there you have it, some of the biggest reasons why I love Halloween and why I think it is one of the best movies ever made. What do you think about this iconic horror landmark? Let me know down in the comments below. And as always, thanks so much for watching the channel. Be sure to stay tuned for even more movie news, reviews, box office, and more. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye. Totally.